My name is Alex Barthet. I am a construction attorney and today we're going to talk about the five most avoidable lien waiver mistakes that we see in our office on a, on a very regular basis. Um, so the first one is not understanding the legal significance of a lien waiver. Uh, and we'll explain, I'll explain why it's important. The next is not negotiating the form of the release when you sign the construction contract. Uh, next is not having a through date or having the wrong through date in the release. Uh, next is not using conditional language. Uh, so when you are expecting a check but don't actually have it, it'd be nice to reserve that right in your release. Uh, and then not adding other exceptions to your release when you uh, have other claims, but you need to issue a release in order to pick up a check. Let's talk about uh, the first one, not understanding the legal significance of a release. Uh, a lien release is a legal document that gives up certain rights that you have in exchange for some type of consideration. The terms of the release uh, are going to govern the relationship of the party. So if you sign a release and it says that you're giving up rights to delay claims, you can't come back later and say that you have a right to delay damages when you signed a release that said you gave them up. Um, so it is absolutely critical that you understand that when you sign a release in order to get a check, that that has significant legal impact. It's not just a ministerial task well, if I sign here, I can go pick up my check. Um, we have had clients come to us where they believe they have significant claims at the end of a job only for us to look at their releases to see, oh, wait a second, every month you signed a release that gave away all your rights to claims and change orders and delays. Now you want to assert a uh, million dollar delay claim. That's going to be difficult to do. Um, the release is important, obviously, because it is a document that everyone expects to get in exchange for a check. Um, everyone wants to know above you, uh, the lender, the owner, that at a point in time, which is going to be the through date, all of, you, all of the rights that you have are extinguished. So they know that when they issue that payment and that money flows downstream, through that date, everybody has, uh, is not owed any money. They know that, that they're not going to have to worry about other claims showing up later. Um, when you sign a document and it says lien release at the top, that doesn't mean that the only right you're giving up is, uh, are your lien rights. There are lots of rights that you have, and the document itself is going to be what is going to govern what rights you give up. So even if the document title is lien release or partial lien waiver and the body of the document says that you're giving up uh, rights to uh, claims, change orders, extras, delays, that's what's going to govern. So don't be fooled by thinking that the title is the significant portion of the document. It's the body of the document. That's why you have to read every lien release. And every lien release, by the way, is different. Um, so a lien release from one contractor is going to be different than the lien release from another contractor. Uh, and there's no reason that the June release it has to be the same as the October release. So you have to read it every month. Every month you have to read those releases. Always remember that where you are in the construction process matters. So if you are a general contractor, you want very broad releases from your subs and suppliers. You want to know that when you issue that check to that sub, that all of their rights are being released. If you are a subcontractor, you, you wear uh, two hats, and that is you want to make sure that when you get a release from your sub, subcontractors, and vendors, that those are very broad. But when you give a release to the contractor, that that is as narrow as possible so that later on, if you have claims, you haven't released them. Not negotiating the form of the release. 
Florida Statute 713 has two release forms in it. They're very simple. One is a partial lien release. One is a final lien release. That partial lien release and final lien release are pretty much the same document with the exception of a through date. The partial has a through date in it. The final does not. It's through the day you sign it. Um, there's a, a little line in the statute that says, no one can make you sign any form of release different than that which is found in Chapter 713. Uh, and there are typically two exceptions to that rule. Um, the first exception is if you sign a contract and that contract says you agree to use the release that's attached as you know exhibit Q to the contract, right? That's why when clients have us review their contract, they say, ah, oh, you know, Alex, he's just, he's so expensive. So, you know what, I'm just going to send him the first 20 pages. He doesn't need to see those exhibits. So I then write back and say, uh, look, I, I, I don't want to review the exhibits, but if you really want to have an understanding of what this contract means and how it works, I need to see the other 50 pages of exhibits. Um, the other reason is that uh, many contractors bury legal terms deep in the exhibits. Um, we find pay when paid uh, language in the exhibits, uh, like in the scope of work, um, release forms. So there's lots of stuff that can be found in those exhibits that you need to review. Uh, most of our clients, uh, they get the document, they look at it, they fall asleep, they wake up, they say, you know what, I'll just look at the scope of work, right? And then they spend four hours reviewing the scope of work. Um, they mark it all up and then they sign it and send it back. Um, but a lot of the issues that happen on a job are going to be governed by what's in the body of that document. One of them, again, being what form of release have you agreed to? So if you've agreed in your contract that you're going to use the exhibit form release, well, then when you're negotiating the contract, make sure you review that exhibit. One of the things we recommend is just include a line in the contract that says the parties agree that the forms of release found in Chapter 713 uh, may be used at time of payment. Right? So forget about what's attached. Uh, we're just going to use the forms found in Chapter 713. Those are pretty generic. Um, the other way that they will, uh, contractors or subcontractors will force you to use a certain release is that they may not attach an exhibit, but somewhere in the body of the, of the contract it says, you agree to use whatever release I deem appropriate at the time of payment. So then you get presented with a release when it comes time to pick up a check, and that's not a release you want to sign, but if you've agreed that they get to pick whatever release they want, it's going to be harder to push back. Um, I told you there were two exceptions. So one is, did you agree to something different than Chapter 713? The other is what's called the golden rule. You all know the rule, right? He who has the gold makes the rule. So if you need the check and they say this is the release you have to sign, it, it becomes pretty difficult to fight that and say, well, no, I, I actually, I went to this seminar and this construction lawyer said, I don't have to sign any other release. And then the contractor looks at you and says, well, is that, is that lawyer going to pay your payroll on Friday? No. So, you know, if you want this check, this is what you need to sign. And we'll talk in a few minutes about ways to deal with that. Um, so we talked about what the, the, the contract requires. Um, so when you have to pick up a release and it comes time to uh, uh, get or pick up the check and you have to sign that release, what are some of the things you can do uh, to deal with that problem? Um, so one of the things is to make sure that you're not giving up more rights than you expect. Uh, and I think that's actually the next, time, the next slide, which is not having uh, a through date or having the wrong through date in the release. So let me explain what the through date is and then how to deal with it in the release. So uh, this is a, a pretty simple partial uh, or progress payment lien waiver. Um, and it says that you're releasing your right to claim a lien for labor materials furnished through, and then it has a spot where you'd put in the date. Um, that is the through date. It's the effective date of the release. 
I'm releasing all my rights through this date. Um, the reason that's important is because anything that exists prior to that date, you are giving up any rights that you have subject to the form of the release. This is a very simple release. This is actually the partial payment release form found in Chapter 713. So this is only a lien release. It only is releasing your lien rights. If you have other rights, they're not necessarily being released by this, this language here. Um, but if you want to make a claim for anything existing prior to the through date, you need to make sure that that through date is appropriate. So does the through date and the dollar amount match? So in this document, it says that you're getting paid some amount of money. If you're, if you're expecting a $100,000 check, and that $100,000 check gets you to the end of the month, but then they're telling you, well, we're not going to pay you 100, we're only going to pay you 80. If you sign a release that says, in exchange for $80,000, you're releasing your rights through the end of the month, you cannot argue later that, well, I only got 80, I submitted a pay rec for 100, so therefore that 20 is out there for me later, and I'll get it the next time or at the end of the job. That's not the way this works. You've given up your rights in exchange for 80 through the end of the month. So if you are expecting a $100,000 check and you're only getting 80, you have to do one of a couple of things. Number one, change the through date. Maybe 80 doesn't get you to the end of the month. It gets you to the 23rd of the month. So your through date needs to be the 23rd. So the amount of money you get and the through date of the release have to coincide with one another. Um, the other thing you can do is you can create an exception to the release. So uh, as an example, if you're a material supplier and you have 37 invoices for the month and you're expecting $100,000 but they're only giving you 80, then maybe you pull out of the release seven invoices that total the difference and you can create an exception in the release that excludes those seven invoices from the release. The important thing is that what matters most is the through date. It is not the amount of money that you get. Uh, sometimes there is no through date. Uh, and if there is no through date, the effective date of the release is the day you sign it. We had a client who, uh, whose practice was you would go to his office, he would have his releases prepared, he'd have the check right there. You'd, you'd show up and um, you would sign the release there, he'd show you the check. Uh, so he would have the notary there, the notary would stamp it, uh, you'd get your copy of the release and the check and you'd walk out. Uh, most people were just so happy, they were salivating to get their check that uh, they wanted to, they just wanted to sign it and be done. Well, what happened is that that release form uh, had no through date. It was effectively a, a, a release through and including the day you picked up the check. So uh, on one matter that we had for this client, we had a sub who came, uh, picked up a $181,000 check, uh, and, but by that time they were 100% done with their work and the job never recommenced. And then they sued for uh, several million dollars of, of uh, work that they did. And we argued that they weren't entitled to it from us because they signed a release, picked up a check, and that release was good through the period of time that they picked up their check, which was after all the work had been done. Uh, and we prevailed on that because uh, they couldn't argue that they didn't get the check that they said they got. Um, so that, that's an example where if you're not careful, you can lose a lot of rights uh, in your claim because it has no through date. Um, their argument was, well, look, if you look at our pay app, our pay app said that we got 182, but we were still owed $2 million. And, and our counter argument was, that doesn't matter because you agreed that $182,000 was a release through and, and including the day you signed it. Um, so you have to be very careful uh, about the through date. So number four, not using conditional release language. So what is a conditional release? Uh, let me paint a picture for you. If you sign a release and you give it to somebody and they promise to give you a check later and that check 
uh, or payment never arrives. Depending on the language of the release, people above them, like an owner, uh, can rely on that release even though you never got paid. So the way you solve that problem is to use conditional language. Here is an example of a sentence that makes any release conditional. And it says, notwithstanding anything in herein to the contrary, this waiver and release is expressly conditioned upon the undersigned receipt of blank, you'd put in however much money you were expecting, in paid funds. Otherwise, this waiver and release is void. Um, so pretty straightforward. You want to release from me. You promise to give me money later. I will include this language in my release to make sure that if I don't get the check, that this release is no good. So we, we just touched on this, the $10 release, right? So this is a big problem. Um, so if you are expecting to get money and you're giving a release, you're, you're always better off including the amount of money that you're actually expecting and avoid uh, the recitation of $10 and other good and valuable consideration. Um, so if you say, if you know you're expecting a check of 55000 you want the release, you should, you should write, strike through $10, uh, even by hand is fine, and write $55,000. Um, because then, as we just talked about, it, it avoids any ambiguity about what you are actually expecting to receive. So this is another one, this is another question or comment we get all the time. I, but I have the original, so I'm okay, right? So we had a client that they would sign releases, it would have the amount of, uh, it would say $10, it would, wouldn't be conditional, and then it was the classic, uh, they would send an email or a fax copy of the check. Uh, she would then sign an unconditional $10 release with, with a through date in it, and then she would fax that back or email it back. Um, and her position was, well, I have this nice original document with my signature in blue. So therefore, the fact that someone's holding a copy means that I'm protected. That is not true. Um, having the original uh, is of no legal significance. What matters is what's on the document. And keep in mind, it's usually not the person you're giving the document to, that's the problem. It's the when it gets passed up the chain, right? So you have a GC that you're dealing with who gets this release, and then they pass it up to the owner. The owner has no reason to know that the money was paid or it wasn't paid. They're just looking at this document. And if this release was uh, procured without payment, the owner who had nothing to do with this is going to be able to rely on that, and they'll and you will lose your lien rights. Uh, as a result. So holding the original doesn't matter. Let me, let me make sure that you understand why this is important. I actually was dealing with a lawyer the other, uh, yesterday um, about exchanging a check for a release. Clearly he was a much older lawyer um, and he was insistent that, that he needed the original. And we told him, no, 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 we record electronically on a regular basis uh, with a copy. Um, so the clerk now will accept uh, a, an electronic copy, right? So nowadays we will send documents to clients. They will sign it electronically. They will email it back. Then we will take that and we will record it. So it never became an original. It never turned into a piece of paper, yet we were able to record it and uh, satisfy liens. Uh, so you understand that, that the significance of an original is really meaningless. Um, so don't, don't harp on the fact that, that you either are going to expect an original um, because it doesn't matter. Now, if you are a contractor, you need to be especially careful um, about receiving a release from a sub-sub or a supplier that is conditional. And the reason is, is that you have no ability to confirm that the condition has been satisfied. Let me explain what I mean. If you're a general contractor on a project, and as the month comes to a close, you um, are gathering all of the releases. So now your electrician gives you a release, uh, and maybe that release is conditional. Probably not a problem. Uh, and then his supplier's release is also conditional. This is where the problem is. 
And the reason there's a problem is because when you as the contractor hand the check to the subcontractor, you have satisfied the condition in the subcontractor's release. No problem. But what if that subcontractor doesn't pay the vendor? You now have a piece of paper from the vendor that says, my release as a vendor is conditioned on me getting a $50,000 check, but you're not giving the check to the vendor. You cannot satisfy that condition. So if your electrician doesn't give the check to the vendor, you have a release that is meaningless. That vendor can still make a claim on your bond or record a lien on the property. So to the extent second tier folks, uh, well, second tier from you, wherever you are, right? So this would happen as a sub too. If you're a sub and you get a release from your sub sub, great. But then your material supplier to your sub sub still has rights. Um, you have this same problem. So to the extent you have any concern about giving a release in exchange for a conditional waiver from folks that far away, you need to satisfy that condition with a joint check. Um, so you need to joint check those people that give you uh, conditional releases that are more than one step away. Um, that's the only way you know with any certainty that the, that the condition is satisfied. Alternatively, you tell them, uh, you tell the electrician, I need an unconditional from your vendor. Because until you give me an unconditional from your vendor, I don't know that, that their releases are, uh, are any good. Um, one of the things we did uh, for some clients is that they, uh, they were using this conditional language often and putting it on releases that didn't have conditional language uh, that we suggested that they make a stamp. Um, so for about 10 or $15, you can take the language that I told you, you make it into a little stamp, and then every release you get, you can just stamp away, and uh, you can make any unconditional release conditional with that stamp. All right, so the last point, not creating exceptions to your releases. Um, so one of the things that we see a lot uh, is when change orders happen in the field, the time it takes for that change order to materialize in, a, uh, in the contract and in the pay apps can be months later. And what happens is many times the language in the release includes all work related to uh, any work that existed in the field prior to the through date of the release. Well, if you think about it, some of the work that you're releasing is change order work that hasn't turned into a change order yet. So uh, you would technically be releasing those rights when you sign the uh, release to get your check, even though it doesn't include the change order that may th three months from now show up on your pay app. So it would be nice, uh, and, and the best practice is to say, every month you would include a list of exceptions to your release for all the claims that you have. So if you have delay claims, if you have unexecuted change orders, so you may have a, uh, an RCO or a PCO log, right? So you've got uh, uh, request for change order uh, 11, 32, 59, right? And those would be exceptions to your release. Um, and then next month, you would change them because maybe request for change order 32 turned into change order 7, uh, and now that's part of your contract. Uh, just know that when you read the document, when you read that release, it may be giving up rights to things that you are thinking are going to turn into change orders later. And 99 times out of 100, it never matters because the paperwork is just paperwork. Where it matters most is when the wheels fall off, something happens, funding stops, lawyers get involved, and then all hell breaks loose because one of the first things that the lawyers do is they look through these releases and they say, oh, look, you want this $500,000 for unexecuted change order work. You don't have a, a signed change order. You know, we're not paying that. And had the job gone on perfectly fine, you would have been paid that two, three, four, five months from now. Um, so just remember, it's not, it's not when things go well that this matters. It's when things don't go well. We saw a lot of this happen in the last recession, uh, where when all these jobs stopped, when all of these jobs stopped, uh, 
the lawyers got involved and, and they're looking for any way not to pay uh, claims and bills and, and the releases are a great way to do that. So here's another uh, sentence you can add to your release that ex excludes from the release things which you want to preserve. Pretty simple. Notwithstanding the foregoing, this waiver and release specifically excludes blank, which is reserved by the undersigned. So uh, if you have claims, uh, you can put them in here. If you have uh, change orders, uh, or I should say unexecuted change orders, requests for change orders, you would list them here. Uh, and then when you sign the release, you know that you are excluding those items from the release. Now look, I, I get it. I understand that you change a comma to a semicolon in a release, and they say, nope, we don't accept any changes to the release, so uh, you know, we're not issuing your payment. Um, we have had some clients who would take the release that was given to them, and they will modify it to include exception language in the body of the document such that if you look at the original release that they had to sign and you look at the release that they created, it has the same font, same paragraph spacing, and unless you read the document, uh, there's exceptions in it. Um, I, I'm here to tell you as well that I'm not sure if you all use the latest version of Adobe Acrobat, but even Adobe PDFs, unless they are locked, can be edited just like Word documents. Um, so you send someone a, a PDF document and say, oh, I don't have to worry, they're not going to change it. Um, you can change a, a, a PDF document as easily as you can change a Word document. And even if it's locked, they'll just retype it. It'll look the same. So when it comes back, it is now an altered document. I would suggest if you are in charge of folks getting releases in order to issue payment, that you should have your staff um, read the releases that they're getting all the time to make sure that they're in fact the releases that you are expecting. Um, again, going back to Textura or programs like that, you don't have to worry about that because there's no other way to submit a release other than the one that's in the system. Um, we also had another client who, as their standard practice in reviewing releases, made sure that they would cross-reference the name on the release with the people listed in the Secretary of State. And if the person that signed the release was not listed on the Secretary of State as an officer of the company, they would reject the release until they got a corporate resolution confirming that John Smith, who's not on the Secretary of State, has the authority to sign releases for the company. Um, that's another safeguard you may wish to employ so that you don't get a release, issue a check, and then a few months later you find out that that person that was uh, getting the checks had no authority to sign the releases. I would tell you that at least in my experience, I'm not sure if you've seen it more often, I, it's a pretty rare event where someone comes back and says that, uh, that they didn't have authority, but if you wanted to mitigate that risk, um, that's the way to do it, is to double check whoever's signing the releases against the Secretary of State. Uh, so you've said, okay, I'm going to create this list of exceptions. Um, do you have to do it every month? And the answer, unfortunately, is yes. Because if you do it for month one, two, three, four, and you skip month five, and you sign a release with, of month five that had no exceptions, and then you go back to uh, putting them in on month six, well, month five kind of erased everything off the board. So every month you have to make sure that if you have exceptions that they, that they stay in your releases month after month. Um, we again talked about you know, any changes to the release may be rejected. Um, that's, a, that's a real problem. Uh, so there's no easy answer to that. It, it, you know, how much do you need the check versus what are you giving up?